Supper with Martha by Rosemary Timperley It was Friday night, his usual night for visiting Estelle, his mistress. He gave his wife a different excuse every week, and she never asked awkward questions. But then Martha was an ideal wife. She kept the house beautifully clean and tastefully decorated. She entertained his business friends when necessary. She never argued with her husband. She waited on him. She fitted in with any arrangements he made. She wasn't extravagant. She was amenable in bed. She didn't flirt with other men. She was never bad-tempered. She was very quiet and a good listener. And most important of all, she was a wonderful cook. So Paul was contented with his marriage and quite envied by his friends, who often had more difficult women on their hands. Why then did he need a mistress? Well, a little variety never did anyone any harm, and Martha, for all her virtues, was a bit dull. She lacked humour and gaiety. She smiled sometimes, in her restrained way, but she never laughed. Estelle was the very opposite. She had all the faults which Martha lacked. She was careless, quick-tempered, talkative, extravagant, flirtatious, but also she was passionate and gay. During their evenings together they would laugh a lot and drink quantities of gin and make love a lot. Supper consisted of not much more than a plate of sandwiches and those not very well made. But Paul was so well fed at home that the scrappiness of Estelle's suppers didn't worry him. He would have hated to be married to an undomesticated firebrand like Estelle. But one evening a week of her company thoroughly cheered him up and even heightened his contentment with Martha's quietness afterwards. Now on this Friday night, when in theory he was dining with some business clients, he rang the bell of Estelle's flat. Usually she came to the door immediately and flung her arms round his neck, the sort of impulsive movement which Martha never made. Then there would be a kiss of passion, wafts of her expensive scent, paid for by him, as also were her pairs of fine stockings and many pretty dresses. Laughter, light music, strong drink, his spirits lightened in glad anticipation. Friday night was gaiety night, but there was no sound now of her quick footsteps approaching the door. Hadn't she heard the bell? He rang again and waited. He glanced at his watch. Was he early or late? No, it was exactly eight o'clock, his usual time. He tried the bell a third time. Still she didn't come. So he bent down and peeped through the letterbox. The little hall was dark and empty. The living room door was closed. This was unusual. The light should have been on, and that door open in a welcoming way. And there was no sound of music, yet she nearly always had the record player on when he arrived. It dawned on him, with angry astonishment, that Estelle had gone out. Gone out? On his night? Of all the bloody-minded things to do, if she'd had to go out, the least she could have done was ring him at the office to tell him so. He'd been there all afternoon. He couldn't have missed a message. Depressed and indignant, he left the block of flats. In the drive, he looked up at the windows of her flat. They were dark, and the curtains had not been closed. He wondered where she was and what she was up to. He decided to go home. There was nothing else to do. Martha might be unexciting, but at least she'd be there and give him something decent to eat. Lights from his house shone welcomingly as he came up the garden path and let himself in. He hung his overcoat and hat on the hall stand, noticed that Martha's coat hung there too, and wondered briefly why it was there, instead of in the bedroom wardrobe where she usually hung it, then went into the living room. Martha was curled up in the big easy chair by the fire. She was reading, as usual. She was a great reader, of many serious subjects. For a month or so she would be reading everything she could find on, say, astronomy. Next month it would be botany, or mathematics, or ballet. All was grist to the mill of her serious, industrious mind. Her present craze was medicine. She was reading everything she could find in the public library about doctors, drugs, anatomy, surgery. Indeed, only the other day he had said to her, We shan't need our GP any longer. I'll bet you know as much as he does now. It had been a mild little joke. She had not laughed. Martha never laughed. However, she had a pretty smile, 
and now she looked up and smiled at him. Any other wife, he thought, would have been surprised to see him when he had said previously that he wouldn't be home for supper. But Martha never showed surprise. She accepted events without any emotion. Her smile now conveyed nothing but mild pleasure at seeing him. Hello, dear, she said. Was your business appointment cancelled? Yes, they rang up this afternoon to put me off. Oh well, it won't do you any harm to have an easy night after working all day. I'll get your supper. Sorry about it, he said. I should have let you know I'd be home tonight. No need. There's always plenty of stuff in the fridge. How about liver and bacon? And some very nice kidneys? My favourite, he said. You are a dear. And he felt a bit ashamed. He was an awful old liar, and she was always so straight. She looked extra pretty tonight, too. Has anything nice happened today? he asked. I have had a nice day. Why? You look happy in your quiet way. I am, she said. I'm very happy tonight. Just for a second, he wondered if he were the only partner in this marriage who was having a secret love affair. But he dismissed the thought. Martha would never be unfaithful, even in thought, let alone in deed. If she were, she would have used Friday night, the night he was usually out. Yet here she had been, sitting by the fire as usual, her nose in a book, bless her. You'd better have a little drink while you're waiting, she said, and served him with a small glass of medium sherry, the only alcohol they kept in the house unless they had guests. Then she went into the kitchen to prepare his meal. Sipping his sherry, Paul considered the contrast between this Friday night and his usual Friday nights. It was nearly nine o'clock. By this time, he and Estelle would have knocked back several double gins and would have been making love on the white fur rug in front of her electric fire while the record player played jazzy music, the sort of music Martha disliked mildly. All her feelings were mild. He glanced at the large book she had been reading, one of her current medical tomes. He flipped through its pages and came across a full-page illustration of the female figure, but not the sort of female figure that he enjoyed looking at. It was an anatomical drawing, showing a cross-section of all the internal organs and all were neatly labelled for the benefit of the student of anatomy. It puts you off women a bit just to look at it. With a touch of distaste, he closed the book, tossed it back on the chair, and brought from his jacket pocket his paperback thriller of the moment. He let his eyes linger on the cover of the book before he began to read. It pictured a voluptuous blonde standing with her back to him, and clad in nothing but her long golden hair and a silver chain anklet. The girl looked rather like Estelle, although her fair hair wasn't as long as that, but it acted as a reminder that Estelle had let him down tonight, and he felt another pang of annoyance and humiliation. This was no way to spend a Friday night. However, when Martha brought his supper he felt more cheerful. Liver, kidneys and bacon, all perfectly cooked. He was hungry and ate the lot. That was really delicious, he said, as he took the last succulent mouthful real cordon blue. Yes, it was rather special, she smiled. You're very good to me, and very trusting, he said, impulsively. You're the one who is trusting, she said. Me? In what way? The way you eat everything I give you. Why shouldn't I? You're such a marvellous cook. That would make it all the easier for me to polish you off if I felt like it. A joke. But Martha never made jokes. Martha never even laughed, so he didn't know how to take the remark. Polish me off, he said uneasily. You wouldn't know how. But of course I would. I've read all the books in the library about the various poisons. I'm glad you enjoyed your supper, dear. It's the last I shall ever cook for you, and I shall quite miss that. I do so enjoy cooking. Martha, what are you talking about? The last supper. Yes, I shall be leaving tonight. Leaving? Yes, I'm not sure when. It depends how soon anything happens. How are you feeling? Paul was feeling frightened. He didn't know what was happening. His heart was beating too fast. The meal he had eaten, with such appetite, was curdling inside him. How are you feeling? she repeated. In... in what way? I was wondering if your supper has agreed with you. Why shouldn't it? It was a lovely supper, Martha. Is this some joke? I never make jokes, said Martha. 
I saw Estelle this afternoon. That gave him such a shock he could have been sick. He said nothing. Martha smiled. Paul muttered, How did you find out? Quite by chance, dear. You left one of her letters in a trouser pocket. I found it when I was taking the trousers to the cleaners, but that was months ago. It's taken me quite a long time to decide what to do. So that's why she wasn't there tonight, he said dazedly. You went in the afternoon and told her that you knew? Yes, said Martha. How are you feeling? Feeling? I mean any indigestion after the supper. I feel sick, he admitted. Poor little sensitive stomach. Did you poison my food? He whispered, sweat on his hands and face. That depends on what you mean by poison. You know what I mean. Did you poison my supper tonight? No, said Martha, smiling. Is that true? Her smile vanished. I have never lied to you, Paul. Never. You have often lied to me. That is a great difference between us. I never lie. I shall not lie about anything now. I carried out a plan. Exactly. Truthfully. Tell you all about it. Well, go on. Then the doorbell rang. Paul jumped, but not Martha. Will you answer it, dear? She said. Don't keep whoever it is waiting on the doorstep. It's a cold night. Paul went to the door. Two police officers stood there. Mr. Paul Ferro, said the taller of the two. Yes. We'd like a word with you, sir. May we come in? They came in. The taller one went, with Paul, into the living room. The other stayed by the front door. And this is Mrs. Ferro, asked the tall policeman. Yes, my wife, said Paul. But what? Mr. Ferro, did you visit Estelle Montjoy at 14 Exley Court at any time today? I went there, but I didn't see her. She was out. What time was this? Look, what is this all about? Just answer my questions, please, sir. I called at eight o'clock. No one answered the bell. She must have been out. Mrs. Ferro, what time did your husband come home tonight? Shortly before nine, answered Martha. Has something happened to her? Paul asked. Yes, said the tall police officer. She's dead. Paul was shaking badly, and he still felt dreadfully sick. Dead? Estelle? But how? We were hoping you might be able to tell us something about that. Your name and address were on this sheet of paper on her bed table when we found her. Paul looked at the name and address on the sheet of paper. They were written in Martha's neat, upright handwriting. He looked at his wife. She smiled sweetly, happily. If I'd killed her, said Paul, I'd hardly leave my name and address. That thought did cross our minds, said the policeman. How did you come to find her? Paul asked. We received an anonymous telephone call, shortly before eight o'clock. The caller, a woman, told us to investigate that flat because the occupant had died. It might have been a hoax, but all the same we went along there. No one answered the bell, so the hall porter let us in with his pass key. Estelle Montjoy was lying on the bed with her throat cut, and there were other... He stopped and turned to Martha who had moved towards the kitchen. Where are you going, Mrs. Ferro? he asked. I have something in here to show you, she said. He followed her into the kitchen. Paul followed them both. Martha pulled open a drawer where she kept a large range of kitchen knives. She picked out the strongest and sharpest. She handed it to the policeman. It was I who telephoned, she said, and this is what I used. The murder weapon is the term, I believe. I have nothing to hide. I am quite ready to come with you. My coat is ready in the hall, and there is no need to tell my husband the details of what I did to the fair Estelle. I'd rather tell him myself. She turned to Paul. I called on the fair Estelle, she said. I told her who I was and she let me in. We talked about you. Something that men never hear unless they eavesdrop is two women discussing them. We had a most interesting discussion. I pointed out to her that my great advantage was that I could cook. I have a genius in that direction. I can cook anything, however vile, and make it tasty. After our talk, I told her she really ought to leave you alone, and she agreed. So to make it easy for her, 
I fetched that knife, and she pointed to the kitchen knife which the policeman still held in his hand, out of my handbag, and very quickly and neatly cut her throat. There was a lot of blood, of course, but I'm not squeamish. No cook can afford to be squeamish. Every kitchen is, in a sense, an abattoir. I carried her, with some effort, into the bedroom and put her on the bed. I wrote your name and address on the sheet of paper, which you have seen. After all, one must help the police a little in these cases. Then I took off her clothes, folded them neatly, and left them on a chair by her bed. Then I cut out her kidneys. That's enough, madam. Come along with us now. The policeman, his eyes hard with horror, took Martha's arm and began to lead her towards the hall. As they crossed the living room, Martha, determinedly, detached herself from the policeman's grip, pointed to the big medical book still laying in the easy chair, and said, I made use of my knowledge of anatomy, dear. I was really very skilful. My first operation. I must be a frustrated surgeon, really. I did it beautifully. You should have seen me. You'd have been impressed. I just cut out her kidneys. Is it true? Paul asked the policeman. From what we could tell of the body, yes. Paul turned to Martha. You cut out her kidneys, dear, yes. And she laughed. It was a beautiful laugh, happy, melodious, like bird song in the morning. Paul had never heard her laugh before. The sound made all other laughter pale into insignificance. She was laughing, laughing. Still laughing, she said. It was the happiest moment of my life. I cut out her kidneys, and you ate them for supper.